So when you make something for enough people to see, you care about being right, you're eventually going to screw up. When you're building something really big that has to scale and be supported and maintainable, um, it's not just a group of individual contributors anymore, right? Like you have to do this thing called teamwork, <laughs> right? When you think about data science, a lot of people think about the models and the models are important, but right. um, that next step, how your model is going to surface in the real world, that right. matters typically a lot more. Powering non-technical people with deep learning. So I think this is you know, a huge opportunity. Steven, welcome back to the Super Data Science Podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. Where are you calling from today? Thanks for having me. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. Nice. You know, I have never been to the Carolinas, but I've heard only good things. It's supposed to be beautiful down there. Yeah, definitely. The weather's been, it's been kind of a soggy winter, I would say, but uh, summers and springs and falls are usually awesome. Beautiful. How, um... How is the lockdown situation down there? Are things opening up? <laughs> yeah, um, I'd say it's okay. You know, my company's been fully remote for, I guess, it's almost a year now, which is pretty crazy to think about. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the city itself, um, the Mecklenburg County, where Charlotte is, is a little more, uh, I'd say, locked down than the rest of the state. Um, but things things feel, you know, reasonably normal. Um, and then vaccines are coming along their way. My, my wife's parents both have um, got their vaccines already, which is great. So oh, they're, nice. they're rolling out, which is good. Yeah, I'm in group five or something, so it'll probably be a little while. But um, but yeah, things are still, you know, reasonably locked down, but life life goes on. Yeah, something certainly there have been a lot of people in my life, um, uh, in my professional community in particular, um, who've been affected by COVID uh, in New York in the spring of 2020. People didn't even know because there wasn't widespread testing, but um, it's estimated that a third of New Yorkers got COVID in oh my gosh. spring of 2020. Yeah. And so I had uh, my accountant and my immigration attorney were both completely knocked out for months. Oh my gosh. And they're young. They're in their 30s, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah. And, and, and some, yeah. And some even bigger impacts actually professionally, but we'll yeah. go into those. However, I feel very lucky that uh, family members, you know, nobody's been sick. And so things like yeah, your likewise. wife's parents getting vaccinated now, I'm like, I can't wait until yeah. grandparents, parents in my family yeah. get vaccinated because I'm going to be like, we made it. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome, right? I feel like, you know, a few months ago, it felt like vaccines were just forever, forever away, right? And now they're really happening, right? Which is, that's freaking awesome. It's just, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. All right. Well, so... I have a I'm I have a budding YouTube channel. I'm like I just started it a year ago. Awesome. And you know, I've got a few dozen videos out there uh, on machine learning and I was excited. So you were recommended as somebody that is an amazing podcast guest by Kirill, the uh, outgoing host of the Super Data Science podcast. And when I was checking out your profile earlier, I was blown away by your YouTube channel. It's called Welch Labs. Thank you. And uh, it's amazing. You have uh, over 300,000 subscribers. You have 20 million views of your videos. And I think that that's especially important because if you think about, so you have highly technical content on neural networks, computer vision, <laughs> self-driving cars. There's one playlist that I can't wait to watch it is beautifully named. It's called Imaginary Numbers Are Real. <laughs> That's so fun. <laughs> and um, so this is technical content. Like probably 1% of people are ever going to be interested in your content. And so right. you've captured a huge amount of, <laughs> of that 1% of people. That's a, that's a cool way to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a hat tip to you. Um, so... I don't know. Do you want to tell us a little bit about, sure. about Welch Labs? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, definitely. So um, kind of got into it haphazardly, like we were kind of mentioning uh, before a little bit. Um, I, uh, I I feel like part of the reason the channel has been successful is I, I had good timing at the beginning. So I really kind of stumbled into it back in 2013. Um, there was a channel at the time called Minute Physics by this creator, Henry Reich, that I was watching. And that just like blew my mind. And I was like, oh, man, why is no one doing this for machine learning? Um, so yeah, I just made a quick video on neural networks. I shouldn't say quick. I I labored over it because I'm a perfectionist <laughs> and I, I can't, uh, but I, I put it out right enough. And it did surprisingly well. Like after less than a week, it had a thousand views. And I was like, a thousand people care about this? That's cool. Um, and uh, now that video has like 700,000 or something crazy, right? So 
Um, yeah, I kind of stumbled into it a little bit, I would say. And then I, I just really, really enjoy it, right? It's never been like a full-time job profession for me. Maybe one day I can have that as a piece of something, you know, but um, but I, I do really, um, I definitely, the create the process of making videos stresses me out sometimes for sure, but I also just really enjoy, you know, making that kind of stuff. So, um, so yeah, it's been a really cool journey. It's kind of been on and off for the last six, seven years. Um, sometimes I have more time for it. Sometimes I have less. Recently, it's been less, unfortunately, but um, but yeah, it's been a, it's been a cool journey and, and yeah, you're right. It, it is pretty technical content. I think something that I try to do, um, no matter what is no matter how technical your content is, I still want to tell a good story, right? Um, it doesn't matter if you're explaining something super esoteric, you know, it, everyone is the same as far as how they're going to engage with content. And if you can tell a story, then it doesn't matter how technical your topic is. You're going to get, I think, better, you know, better engagement. Yeah, well, the uh, the labor that you put into those videos has certainly paid off. I absolutely love the ones that I looked at. I thought that the production quality was really high and you told the stories beautifully. So, um, you know, if you're one of the few people out there who's listening to this podcast who hasn't already been at the Welsh Labs YouTube channel, then I highly recommend checking it out. Um, and so you mentioned how you don't have that much time for Welsh Labs lately. So what have you been doing in the last two years since you were last on the Super Data Science Show? When you were last here, you were uh, most of your recent professional experience was uh, in autonomous vehicles and self-driving cars. And that's what you and Kirill primarily spoke about. However, you were at that time, you were transitioning uh, into a role applying machine learning models to manufacturing at a company called Mariner. And now you've been doing that for two years. So do you want to fill us in? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, I think the timing is really appropriate. I, it'd be funny to go. I haven't listened to that podcast, but I should go back and listen because I feel like I was uh, I was very bright eyed and bushy tailed <laughs> about hopping into a new industry. Um, and it has been, you know, it's been a, an awesome learning experience. Um, but I would say, like, if you kind of look at the differences between where I was before and where I was now, I, I think there's some interesting, you know, I certainly learned a lot. And I think talking about it hopefully has some has some lessons to it. Um, so like, you know, in, in, autonomous driving is just an awesome engineering problem, right? There's so many cool problems wrapped up in there. You know, it's super interesting to work on. Um, at the same time, you know, when I was part of that company, I was like the ML lead basically, right? So, you know, my whole life was training models, you know, um, and just making sure that they were, you know, as safe as I could make them. And I did some work on simulation, things like that. Um, but now, now it's a totally different industry manufacturing. Um, and in some ways manufacturing is maybe less sexy, right? Maybe the problems are less like glamorous, right? Um, but at the same time, manufacturing just has this awesome scale to it, right? So, you know, if you think about the carbon footprint of manufacturing, think about, you know, how much it impacts your life. Um, it's huge, right? And just the scale is, is mind boggling. So it's really interesting because, you know, when I talked to, to Cairo back in 2019, you know, uh, the initial modeling had kind of been done for a customer, a couple customer projects. Like we had the POC models in place. We could say, hey, customer, you're going to get 98% accuracy at, at quality defects, for example, right? Um, and now those models are in production, like they've been in production for like, in some cases up to a year, like doing real stuff, but getting to there and getting those models maintained and, you know, actually working, it's, it's been a journey for sure. So definitely a lot of lessons along the way. And a lot of the reason that I've been uh, a little too busy to make videos recently. <laughs> As, um, I'm, I'm surprised to hear you say all this because we have a quote from two years ago that says, this is going to be easy. I'm going to be <laughs> loaded in no time. Uh, you didn't say anything like that. Um, <laughs> but funny. So you, I recently read a blog post from you. So it describes how you had this particular journey in 2020, a really, um, a really challenging journey with getting a manufacturing model, a big manufacturing model into production. And it sounds like that was quite uh, time consuming, quite laborious, getting everything to work, getting all the pieces glued together and working perfect for the client. Um, was a stressful experience. And then, so maybe you could fill us in a bit on, on that in a second. But uh, uh, the blog post starts off by saying that then when the holiday season approached, the so end of 2020, you finally had a moment to breathe and reflect on the year. And so um, tell us about uh, last year in a, in yep. a little bit. Um, and, then, and then we're going to get into, so the, the blog post has 10 items that based on your reflection, these are the really important things um, at the intersection of your work life and just you know the meaning of your life and your purpose in life. Um, and so I can't wait. We're going to try to make time to talk about all awesome. 10 of those items. I love every single one. Um, so first, yeah, give us some context on, on the year leading up to that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so yeah, and I think this is all kind of, you know, it, it happens on the stage of the pandemic, right? 
Um, and I kind of start the post just by saying, hey, you know, this year has been different for everyone, right? Um, and as far in the grand scheme of things, I feel incredibly lucky. You know, my family's healthy. Uh, I'm healthy. Uh, I still have a job. You know, that's that's a huge blessing. Um, so, you know, as far as, you know, I don't have a lot of reasons to complain, right? <laughs> it's kind of the first thing. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it does impact even people like me who are super blessed to have jobs and have be healthy. Um, it still is different, right? There's changes that really do impact how you work, how you think, you know, all this stuff. Um, and, and just like you said, John, you know, the it was a really busy year anyway. So if there had been no pandemic, it would have been pretty crazy. But I, I think that by working at home, working remotely, and I, I'd done some remote work before, but uh, never this much, right? Never a fully distributed team like this. Um, and bringing on new people and being in a little bit more of a leadership ro role, you know, definitely a new set of challenges. Um, and I really found that when I got a chance to reflect on the year that um, being stuck at home, really the, the biggest thing for me was it, it was hard to change my perspective, right? Because being stuck at home for me is kind of the opposite of like traveling, right? So whenever I do get a chance to travel or go on vacation or whatever, when I come back, I have such better clarity. I'm like, what's important? You know, that that problem I was spending so much time stressing about doesn't actually matter, you know, all that stuff, right? Um, and that was really missing for like 12 months, you know, just grinding away, trying to get this product shipped. Um, and I never had that chance to, to breathe. I never gave it to myself because I didn't have, I don't know, I, I, in hindsight, it's like, oh, just, you know, go for, say, you know, you don't have to leave your house to feel different, but but it just helps, you know? So um, so I think I think over the holidays, you know, I took a full week off and just really, actually, I read all my old journals from the whole year and I was like, Steven, why are you, why are you just like getting stuck in these problems? You know, like I just would get um, so wound up on stuff. And I, I think for me, that was a big way the pandemic impacted me. Just like being stuck in one house, it was just hard to get out of my own head <laughs> sometimes, you know? Um, so that's one reason I wrote the post, just because I wanted to kind of reflect on that, get my thinking clear about it. You know, what did I you know, learn? What happened? Um, and then I reflected back and saw that, you know, I really did learn some cool stuff in 2020. I really did grow in some ways, but I didn't like, you know, I wasn't quite aware of it. Um, so I came up with like kind of 10 areas that I think, hey, you know, if I wasn't able to focus on the big important things in 2020, what did I miss? <laughs> and these are the 10 kind of, you know, things that I, I, I kind of wish I'd focused on more at the time, but at least I'm thinking about them now, you know? So um, that was kind of the, the, the impetus for, uh, for getting this, this recorded. Beautiful. I'm so excited to talk about all of these. And for listeners, we are going to provide, of course, the blog post link in the show notes. But if you're just popping up Google to look it up, it's called Coming Up for Air, which is a great title given how Stephen's been talking about finally having a chance to breathe. Um, and yes, it was published on Valentine's Day 2021. Uh, yep. So February 14th. Eliminating unnecessary distractions is one of the central principles of my lifestyle. As such, I only subscribe to a handful of email newsletters, those that provide a massive signal to noise ratio. One of the very few that meet my strict criterion is the Data Science Insider. If you weren't aware of it already, the Data Science Insider is a 100% free newsletter that the Super Data Science team creates and sends out every Friday. We pore over all of the news and identify the most important breakthroughs in the fields of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. The top five, simply five news items. The top five items are handpicked, the items that we're confident will be most relevant to your personal and professional growth. Each of the five articles is summarized into a standardized, easy to read format, and then packed gently into a single email. This means that you don't have to go and read the whole article, you can read our summary and be up to speed on the latest and greatest data innovations in no time at all. That said, if any items do particularly tickle your fancy, then you can click through and read the full article. This is what I do. I skim the Data Science Insider newsletter every week. Those items that are relevant to me, I read the summary in full. And if that signals to me that I should be digging into the full original piece, for example, to pour over figures, equations, code, or experimental methodology, I click through and dig deep. So if you'd like to get the best signal to noise ratio out there in data science, machine learning, and AI news, subscribe to the Data Science Insider, which is completely free and no strings attached at superdatascience.com slash DSI. That's superdatascience.com slash DSI. And now let's return to our amazing episode. All right, so let's do it. I, I, Oh, this is so great. So let's start <laughs> off with number one. What's number one of 10? 
Okay, great. Well, thanks so much. Yeah. So number one, uh, just to kind of get going through the list here, it's really, it's, you know, empowering non-technical people with deep learning. So I think this is, you know, a huge opportunity. Um, I, I think that the, there's so much we can do with deep learning. Um, and I think that as far as like kind of the core research, like I, um, maybe I'm just not reading enough papers, but I feel like kind of some of the core, especially in computer vision, like we kind of go over this core hub, hump of like improved performance, right? So we've got these great new tools, right? Um, but they really haven't penetrated a lot of industries yet, right? So some industries are kind of a no-brainer. This is another interesting difference when going from autonomous driving to manufacturing, right? So on autonomous driving, everyone and their mom is using deep learning, right? If you're not using deep learning and autonomous driving, it's gonna be really hard to solve some of these computer vision problems. Um, manufacturing is like the opposite, right? So uh, the penetration is like at best 25%, but it's probably worse. Um, so you have, it's crazy, right? So you have all these systems yeah. out there. Can I yeah. interrupt you with a really oh, please, interesting please. story about computer yeah. vision and yeah. self-driving cars? Um, at a conference in ooh, around 2015, maybe 2016, yeah. um, the International Conference on Machine Learning, ICML, uh, yep. I went to an amazing talk about the history of neural networks. Nice. And I can't remember the speaker's name now. Uh, he isn't someone who comes up in deep learning conversations all the time. Right. But the front row at this talk was a who's who of big names in deep learning, like nice. Yann McCone. He was there awesome. sitting in the front row, nodding his head. Yeah. And the speaker would sometimes just kind of like, like just say out to the front row, he's like, did I get that right, Yann? <laughs> <Or whoever. laughs> awesome. And then they yeah. speak back and say, and cool. the, the, so he was talking about the history of, of deep learning and the research yeah. communities around it since the 80s. And he showed a video of a self-driving car with an end-to-end -end convolutional neural network yep, yep. driving the car in the 80s. Yep, yep. Um, anyway, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's that super cool. Yeah, I, in one of my videos, I, I covered, yeah, the, the guy's name who did that is Dean Pomerlo. Um, and I actually I got him to be on a call on my video, spoiler alert, but he's actually, <laughs> I get to talk to him on the video. Um, he's the Whoa. nicest guy and he's super smart. Yeah, he was doing end-to-end -end deep learning self-driving cars in like 1986-ish, something like that. I was negative one. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, he's a. It, it's a really cool story, and it's it's uh, it was so ahead of its time, and like he had a lot of the same challenges. It was, it was super interesting, actually. In my in the course I teach, this is a diversion, but in the course I teach, I have my students train the same style neural network that he did back in the eighties. It's really uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's really cool. Anyway, I interrupted you, but you ended up having some of the background information that I didn't have. That was amazing. All right. <laughs> so anyway, you you want to empower people with deep learning. Yeah, and we're talking about penetration of computer, of yeah, deep learning models, yeah, varies yeah. by industry. Right. So yeah, that was a very fun diversion. I feel like we could have gone longer, <laughs> but yeah. So it definitely depends on the industry, right? Um, and manufacturing is really interesting too because the problems are so varied. So if you take autonomous driving, right? You know, like every autonomous company needs a way to recognize cars, right? So there's kind of like global problems. Um, in manufacturing, like everyone's a freaking snowflake. So you like you talk to people and they're like, oh, you know, I'm making uh, this kind of widget. And, you know, every other Thursday I get this kind of weird bump on my widget. Can you help me find it and not make these anymore? <laughs> right. <laughs> Stuff like that. Right. Um, so you're not going to be able to go find an open source data set that has you know their kind of widget in it. Right. Um, so it's very specific. Right. Um, and really, we've found that as much as I like data science, the more we can get the data scientists out of the way and really empower the domain expert who knows all about widgets to just use deep learning as another kind of tool in their quality tool belt, uh, the better, right? So I think there's I think there's huge opportunity there. And I think that further, maybe no one has quite figured out the right interface between non-data scientists and deep learning models, right? Clearly, their deep learning models are being trained in the background when you scroll Instagram and stuff, right? But that's that's not much of an interface, right? And it's mostly, you know, mostly tar targeted at, at advertising, which is fine, of course. But the um, as far as like having a tool that someone can use to like, you know, if you're not a data scientist, I think there's just huge opportunity there. Yeah, there's there's definitely. I mean, I think we probably interact with it at least dozens of deep learning yeah. algorithms a day. Right. Uh, there's you know, there's some. Things like your phone recognizing your face, um, your Amazon device recognizing your voice or whatever. Right, right. All those things use deep learning. But I get your point that there's a big gap in terms of, um, especially a domain expert, being right. able to say, I run into this problem every Thursday, my widget's having a bump on them. And right. I know that there's a pattern here. 
Hakim, I don't have a model or a tool. Yeah, can exactly. Right. Yep. Yep. And if they have to go do some big consulting agreement and bring in a data scientist for six months to study the problem, that's it's too slow. Right. Some companies can do that and it makes sense. But there's, you know, if everyone that can, there's 100 that can't. And if you can reach that market, then it's, it's awesome. You, you, big opportunity for sure. Nice. So is that kind of the end of point one or do you have like, is it kind of like an open ended point one or do you have some ideas on how this can be resolved? Yeah. So the, the fun part about this post is I have no answers. I only have questions. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. All right. So that's problem number one that we need to sleep for. Yeah. Empowering someone, non-technical with deep someone, someone please solve that and then email me and then we'll, <laughs> we'll go from there. <laughs> just uh, if you could send me, if you could uh, create a GitHub repo with a yeah, solution. Yeah. Just send me the link. Just, put it, yeah, yeah, please use the MIT license so I can <laughs> I can borrow it and then that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right. So item two. Yeah. Is... So, so two is really about teams, right? So I call this one teams you know, really collaborating in software engineering. Um, and this was this was I'd say an area that you know I've been aware of um, for a while, but it really started to come into focus more in 2020 for me, especially having to work on such a big project remotely, right? Um, and I think if I look back at like the beginning of my career, like a lot of the things I was most proud of are things that were kind of individual contributor kind of roles, right? So, you know, like, yeah, you're on a team, but it's like, you kind of own this thing, right? And like, and if I think about YouTube, right, that's like very much individual contributor role, right? Um, and that's great. Um, but I think something that I really kind of picked up on and had to learn, I think in 2020, is that when you're building something really big that has to scale and be supported and maintainable, um, it's not just a group of individual contributors anymore, right? Like you have to do this thing called teamwork, <laughs> right? Um, and I thought I knew what that was, but I, I think I kind of learned it a layer deeper, right? Like how to really get your team to, um, and you know, I'm, I'm basically in a, in a tech lead role. So, you know, I, I, I do some management with some, some coding at the same time, right? Um, so it's an interesting role to be in, right? Um, and there's this whole management leadership side that I hadn't really thought about explicitly before. Um, that really, I think 2020 got me, kind of forced me to, to have to think about more deeply, you know. Um, and I, again, I think it's a super interesting area. I'm honestly way at the bottom of the learning curve on this. Again, open-ended questions. Um, but it was definitely something that I, I, I definitely got snapped into focus, I would say, by the, you know, by remote working and by kind of being put in this area where I was building probably the biggest distributed system I'd ever built, right? Or I should say the team had ever built, right? Um, so I, that was, you know, a, a really interesting part of 2020 for sure. Nice. And there's a beautiful table, which I guess you made. Uh, there's this table, the blue and green table on uh, kind of traits, characteristics of individual thinking versus team thinking. Did you make that, Stephen? I did. Yeah, I was trying to think through like, what do each of those feel like? Because I think a trap you can fall into, a, a trap that I would fall into is like, you know, like we got to go solve this problem as a team, basically, right? Um, and, and sometimes you want to kind of, you want to just, let's go have an individual contributor go work on this, figure out what they think is best, and then kind of present it to the team. But sometimes you really want to do like more team thinking from the beginning. And what this kind of feels like to me is like, um, you know, probably three or four years ago, if I was kind of working on a tough problem and I was kind of looking at some academic papers and trying to figure out the right way to approach it, you know, um, I would kind of do that more in isolation. And then when I felt comfortable and confident, then I would come to the team and say, I've figured it out, you know. Um, and I think that I think part of having a good team dynamic is really having a place where people are comfortable and they don't feel judged and they can they can be way at the beginning of an idea and say, oh, you know, I'm thinking about this. What do you think? Right. Um, and my the team that I work on has become much more like that over the last 18 months. We've really had to. And I really I really enjoy it now. Right. I used to kind of, you know, and I think it's just because cultures I've worked in in the past have been less amenable to that. Right. They've been you know, you just feel a little, and I hate to say it, but you feel a little more judged or like you kind of have to have it perfect before you get it in front of the team. So, um, so this table kind of, you know, I'm just trying to kind of capture like, what does it feel like to be in that individual mode? And what does it feel like to be in that, in that team mode? You know? Yeah. I think it's a great summary. I've been skimming it here as you've been speaking. I promise I've been listening, uh, <laughs> but the table, it beautifully summarizes kind of the, the pros and cons of individual versus team thinking, you know, there's a place for both. I think that's, right. that's a big part of the point that you're making here. So for example, you know, teams don't write novels, uh, but individuals don't write operating systems. So depending on the kind of task you're facing, there's a right, there's a right mix. And then sub, some subtasks are going to be appropriate for an individual or team within a broader, maybe team task, like building a production system. Right. Um, and so it summarizes nicely how like individual thinking is highly nonlinear. And so you right. can have maybe some, some creativity comes out of that, but it also is kind of scary. <laughs> right, right. Yep. <laughs> um, uh, whereas with team thinking, um, yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's sometimes not a depth 
that you can get into. But at the same time, there's a that sharing and mixing of ideas and perspectives can lead to serendipitous um, op- opportunities that you couldn't have thought of on your own. Or you Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think the results are better. And then I think also the thing to think about is if you do, if you if if you involve the team early on in an idea or what you're working on, you will get more buy-in basically, right? So if I pick some technology to go use kind of by myself and I'm like, oh, you know, I looked at this problem and hey, I want to use um, this kind of neural network or something. Um, if I decided that on my own, right, and I could be totally right, but then I kind of blindside everyone with it like a month later, right, and I'm, I'm already way deep in it, right? Um, then, then I'm not going to have as much buy-in, right? Where people are, they might they might question and say, hey, you know, why did you make this decision? But now it's too late, right? So even even if it's just a sounding board kind of relationship, I feel like it it's tremendously valuable because now the team kind of knows, oh, you know, Stephen's doing this problem this way for that reason. Um, I get it, you know, I understand why, and it, it, just that buy-in alone, I feel like is worth for for certain kinds of problems. Uh, you know, trying to to work on them as a team early early on, you know. So you and I live in similar kinds of worlds. We are involved in uh, creating machine learning models and putting those machine learning models into production. Um, I I assume, you know, I think a lot of listeners are in a similar kind of situation or involved somewhere along that stack or interested in being involved um, in maybe many parts of that kind of process from uh, model invention all the way through to putting things into production. And kind of a piece of advice that, um, that I've, that I've realized actually in the last year as well is that a lot of the more senior people uh, that I work with directly, they tend towards the team thinking. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of, I'm encouraging the less experienced people to move away from the individual thinking as much as they can and into the team thinking. And I think it's, it's even more obvious, as you say, when we're working remotely like this, where I'm like, right. Some of the people on my team, I'm hearing from several times a day. Right. And then there's, you know, some people, and it tends to be somewhat less experienced where they, you know, I'm, I kind of have to prod to get right. that one right. update of the day. Yeah. And totally. I'm like, all right, where do we get to today? Yep, um, yep. <laughs> and there's, there's, um, I guess they don't mind. <laughs> they may, I think they might not find it scary being like doing that and like getting their head down and really digging yep. through the problem and trying to get things perfect. But I do agree that generally speaking, of course, there is a place where getting your head down, being yep. really focused on your own is important, especially right. in software and data science. It happens all the time. Right. But in general, I would say if you can, um, you know, talk to people on your team, talk to your manager every few hours, you know, I yep. think yep. two or three, maybe up to upwards of four times a day is the right amount of time to be getting feedback, even on um, problems that you think you should be um, tackling deeply on your own. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think the pandemic makes it more obvious, basically, or working remotely makes it more obvious, like what that cadence is. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Yeah, and I think I think part of that is setting the right culture, right, where people feel comfortable, you know, coming up with a, a half baked, you know, idea. I think that's so important. Yeah. I guess I should stop being really, really hard on those more senior people. <laughs> oh, uh, you're an you're an idiot. Why'd you say this? <laughs> Why'd you bring that up? Um, all right. Um, all right. All joking aside, we, okay. Uh, yeah. what's, what's what's number three? Number three is education. Education. Yeah. Um, so just a little background. So um, you know, obviously I do YouTube, which I think is you know uh, that's educational. I you know that, that's a of it for sure. No question. Um, but I, I also teach um, a graduate level course at uh, UNC Charlotte um, in computer vision. Um, I taught it for three years now, and this year was the first time fully remote, um, and you know for obvious reasons. Um, and to be honest, it, it kind of sucked, right? So I mean, again, like I had awesome TAs. Uh, the university has been really, really supportive, um, but I just really missed the in person component, you know. And we did some things online that I think helped, right? Um, so like we tried to make it as interactive as we could, you know, with uh, People asking questions over the chat or whatever, whatever made sense. Um, but I still just like there's something about being in front of a group of people. I think part of it is kind of the bandwidth of the communication. So as much as it's nice to chat with you over video right now, if we were in the same room, there'd be like a whole set of cues that that we would be picking up on that we're not. Right? Yeah, and it would I, I I would bet a lot of money we'd actually have a different conversation in person, right? Totally. Not that this conversation is bad, but it would be different, right? Um, and especially I notice when I'm in front of a group. Um, you get a little nervous and you get a little like energy, but it can be really positive energy too, right? Um, and when I have like 30 or 40 or 50 students who are all like, you know, some hopefully engaged, 
Um, but there's so many cues out there. I can look at people's eyes and I can be like, oh, this person is a little behind. This person thinks I'm an idiot. This person, you know, and it's so helpful because that lets me moderate my energy and like, you know, just be a more effective uh, communicator. Right. Totally. Um, and gosh, did I miss that? Like, I, I it's funny when I when I lectured in person for the first two years of teaching this course, um, I would leave lecture like energized and excited for the rest of the day and like pumped, you know, and I would finish an online lecture and just be like so exhausted just like drained, you know, just like, what's the point, <laughs> you know, that kind of, that kind of thing, which, which sucks. Right. Um, so that was kind of the experience of, that was another layer of 2020. Um, and again, you know, I think, I hope students got a lot out of the course. You know, I think I know some of them certainly did. Um, and the TAs were great and everything. I'm not complaining about that. It's just, just, you know, uh, remote is definitely a challenge. So, you know, that got me thinking about, uh, you know, something that I do think about from time to time for sure is, you know, education in general and kind of where it's going and what the intersection of the internet and education is. Um, Cause the internet has done so much awesome stuff for education, right? So, I mean, you know, the, there's so many resources now that weren't there. And I kind of remember like right when this started, like when I was an undergrad, it would have been like 2005 to 2009. Um, that's like when MIT open courseware was kind of getting going. And right? you have, your undergrad yeah. is from Georgia Tech, right? It is, yeah. And so now there's a, I, the computer science master is offered completely online by Georgia right. Tech. It is, I yeah. think is absolutely brilliant. I have someone Good. who used to work yeah. for me who did that master's and he was so yeah. switched on about Good. Uh, modern computer science and he did it entirely yeah. remotely. Um, that's awesome. So, yeah. Anyway, I, oh yeah, that's that's fantastic. Yeah, so that's where I was back then, right? Um, and I remember discovering Open Courseware from MIT, and I was like, "Holy crap, these lectures are amazing!" <laughs> right? And my lectures were good at Georgia Tech, but the MIT it was there's there's one professor at, at MIT named Gilbert Strang, um, who's just like his yeah. layout of course is just yeah, I've heard of so so good, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, so you know, there's more content than ever, right? Which is which is nice. Um, but it, same time, if you go fully virtual, right? And I know there's some good ways to do it, and I'm, I'm that's awesome. That I, I have heard a lot of good reports about the Georgia Tech fully virtual thing. Um, that I think that's awesome. Um, but at the same time, like at least my experience has been teaching online, you just lose a lot, right? And it makes it makes me wonder about you know what's going to happen in education. Will more things go virtual? Because the other thing that I'm, we're seeing at like UNCC, for example, is there was a big drop in enrollment, and it's because people don't want to pay that full tuition price for online courses, which makes sense because they're comparing it against all the other online courses, right? Like, mm -hmm. so like, what is the role of in person, you know, versus uh, versus virtual, right? Clearly, internet has a role to play. Um, and how is this going to change in this century, right? And like, is, is, is college going to look different this, this century than last century, right? Um, and as promised, I have no answers for you, only questions, but, but I, think, I think it's a question I like to think about because I think it can really inform some interesting action for sure. <laughs> yeah, this one in particular, when you read the blog post, there are a lot of questions in here about uh, yeah. how, yeah, what's the right balance of uh, virtual and not, and yeah, this huge opportunity around virtual instruction, obviously people, yep. like right now, the podcast, people, yep. Yep. Uh, 10,000 people are going to listen to this podcast at least. And, um, and, you know, we couldn't have that kind of scale if we, if we wanted to try to like right. fly Steven into New York and then we'll <laughs> book like a right, giant right. conference center. Yeah. And have, yep. Like it just wouldn't happen. Yep. Um, so by, by having this kind of, you know, these, these virtual ways of engaging with content, you can get a scale that you couldn't otherwise possibly get, but it doesn't feel certainly all of the situations you described about, um, teaching in person, I, I think is, you know, so as an instructor, yes, absolutely not as not, it's much harder to read the room. It's, it's totally. exhausting. Um, you know, you talk about when you're, when you're in front of a room lecturing, it's so interesting. There's like, there's an energy yeah. that you can see and you're like, okay, it's time for a break. <laughs> um, yeah, man. Yep. or yep. like, all right, people are really into this. I'm going to yeah. like, you know, we're hitting yeah. a home run today. Um, <laughs> right. but online, you just have no idea. Uh, you don't. And even if you see someone's face for some reason, I think it's body language, I guess. I don't know, but the, the face is way better than just audio, I think usually, but, um, even that is still, there's still so much missing. It's, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's something. <laughs> Everybody smells great today. Yeah, it's the smell. Uh, exactly. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, so even even so, as an instructor, it is yeah. definitely not as good of an experience. But I think for students, it's even worse because so much of what students gain from, even if it's like a weekend Saturday course that I'm teaching or a whole university curriculum, I think especially if it's a whole university curriculum, yeah. to be able to come in person 
And hear what other people are working on, talk to them over lunch, go out and grab a coffee with them. And you build relationships for the future professionally, personally, that you just, you can't today simulate online. And so I guess that's a lot of your questions are related to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. hundred percent. All right, we got to move on to number four. I love talking All about right. that. We're going right. to motor on. And we're, so number four, this is a bit more technical. Uh, it it's about algorithms. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is a fun one. Um, this is probably the most technical one of the day, I think. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is really about unsupervised and semi-supervised learning. Um, so just for a little bit of context about what, you know, what I've been up to for the last two years, right? So, you know, been working on um, really getting deep learning into factories, right, into manufacturing. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, um, one of the challenges is that you have very specific problems. It, every manufacturer is like a snowflake, right, or they, at least they believe they are. And in some ways they are as far as their images and as far as their data. Um, so like the challenge is like it's, it's very expensive and in some cases almost impossible to make really large data sets, right? And I guess when I say really large, like, you know, 10,000 examples or more, like that's gonna be, that's gonna be really hard. Um, a thousand, maybe, but still, still kind of hard. Um, and then down to a hundred, you know, feasible, um, depending on what's going on. Part of the challenge is that like, you know, who is the final decider of quality at a manufacturer? So there are people whose jobs are quality engineers, but you get three in a room and they might disagree on, you know, certain examples, things like that, right? Um, so at the end of the day, when we look at, you know, at Mariner, we look at, you know, what are some of the, where do we focus our time, right? What are the hard problems? Um, I think there's really two layers to it. And I kind of glossed over this at the beginning, but there's this whole software engineering layer. So, you know, we deploy deep learning for quality inspection in factories. So we have to have like an edge component. Um, so we run like Linux servers in the factory that are making decisions. Like by the time I finish this sentence, we'll process like 10 more images, something like that. Um, so yeah, there's that whole... In- Go Just ahead. a quick terminology thing for uh, yeah. probably many audience members know this, but an edge component means um, like a like a sensor or some kind of compute happening, yeah. uh, not on a centralized server, but kind of right. uh, on site in real time. Yeah, yeah. So that that's a big challenge for what we're doing, basically, because we, we we can't afford the latency, right? So we have to make real time quality decisions, basically, and we also have to be robust to internet outages. Um, so all of our compute happens on premise, right? So yeah. we we deploy Linux, you know, GPU powered uh, computers. Uh, in some cases, you have kind of one per factory. In some cases, you have one per production line, um, which is an interesting set of challenges there. So at the end of the day, you know, it ends up being a large scale distributed deep learning system, right? Um, and uh, I don't know about you, but uh, my th- that's a big complicated beast, right? A lot of things can go wrong shipping all this stuff because at the end of the day, we want to retrain these models. So we, we move data up to the cloud, retrain models, push models back down, all this infrastructure and stuff. Um, lots of interesting things can happen. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I can only imagine. I, I, I always have, I can always assume access to any of my production models via the internet at any time. Uh, yeah, so yeah, totally. I, yep. Yeah, it sounds really challenging. I don't even, I wouldn't even it's, know where to start. It's super interesting, and I kind of glossed over it, but at the beginning of the blog post, I kind of talk about just a short story from last year. This is maybe, this probably represents some of the challenges that we faced. Um, so we had this this big go live, is back in August last year, um, and we'd been working our butts off, you know, getting ready for it. Um, and it was, just, it was just one production line, so it was kind of a phased go live, right? Um, and we did all our testing, we, we barely made this deadline, you know, we got the code shipped and everything. Um, and then we realized we had a memory leak. So um, literally you would turn on the system monitor and the, the RAM would start creeping up, right? Um, which is never never a good thing to see. Um, so uh, our, our application is containerized, right? So, so most of the components are, are um, they're not affected by, by an overall, they basically allocate their own RAM, so it's okay. But our application also has a web-based front end, which does not have such nice partitioning for its RAM usage. Um, so literally the front end of our application, which was used for the, the operators in the factory to see what's actually happening, right? It would crash every six hours um, or eight hours maybe, right? So we were like, holy crap. Of course, this happened on a Friday. All important bugs happen on Fridays. <laughs> um, so we and literally- releases, why do they always happen on Fridays? We, we actually moved our entire release schedule to never, we, yeah, yeah, that was <laughs> absolutely so. Um, yeah, release on like a Tuesday, right? No, not, not a Friday, so. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, so yeah, we, we literally made a support rotation for the weekend where one of us would wake up every six hours, basically, and restart. We'd remote into the machine, 
restart Chrome, right? <laughs> like, so, <laughs> so, like, I mean, come on, that, that's super uh, embarrassing. Like, we've been working on this technology for months now, and you have to log in every six hours manually <laughs> and, and restart. Like, that's so depressing, right? Uh, we had a cron job. We, we had a cron job do it pretty quickly, but at the, I, I think there was some problem with automating the Chrome restart, so we had to do it manually for the first you know, six days or something. And we had we had the we had the fix shipped by the middle of the next week, something like that. So you know, uh, the team really hustled and got it done, which is great. Um, and I, and, you know, uh, we got through it. But um, man, it just, it just kind of like I don't know. There, there's so much that can go wrong when you're in that messy, noisy, dirty environment of the of, of manufacturing, right? That that you might not think about when you're in a pure cloud kind of kind of setup. Um, so yeah, and machines overheating, you know, all, all kinds of different things that can, you know, cause you're, it's the hardware all the way up to the software, right? So I've, I've, and I think I have a, a bullet point coming up actually. Yeah. When we get to number six, we can maybe talk more about databases and stuff nice. <laughs> cause that, that, that's, that's just a, such a cool world that I've been able to learn more about this year. Um, but what I was trying to talk about was unsupervised learning because what I was, what I was getting at was that, uh, I'd say in manufacturing, at least for us, there's two big areas we see as, as areas that we spend our time focusing on because they're kind of the hard problems. Um, so one is, one is certainly software engineering infrastructure kind of stuff. The other one is unsupervised learning and semi-supervised learning because again, getting a quality label data set as far as our data science pipeline is by far the bottleneck. Like that's the hardest thing, right? Because I can't just sit down and label it. I don't know what your bumps on your widgets look like exactly right i for a couple of customers i've kind of learned you know about the bumps on my widgets <laughs> <laughs> i need i need a better metaphor that's it <laughs> you know about the bumps on my widgets oh man all right let's say uh let's say scratch <laughs> scratches on no it's not, not better yeah it's not better <laughs> just the, keep going. the uh, indi- no, there's no it's, it's all idea. bad it's all bad now um so, but, but uh, for a couple of domain industry, I've learned like a bunch, I can like label, I know a bunch about fabric now for, I can, I can tell you like 25 fabric, different kinds of defects, oh, wow. um, but that's not very scalable, right? For me to go into every industry and learn That'll about. That'll be your next blog post list. Yeah. Here are the 25 <laughs> types of, you know about yarn flashes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think anyone would read that except maybe some fabric quality engineers, but I don't think they, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> so so that's a big challenge, right? So the idea is, you know, can we learn with less data, right? Which is obviously a big area of research. Um, but I, I guess, you know, it, I'm not as up to date on the literature as I once was. But to me, like as far as like the deep learning technology that I feel comfortable as a data science deploying and getting to like that 99 point whatever percent we need for production, I really only deploy supervised deep learning, right? Um, I would love to deploy some semi-supervised or unsupervised. Um, I'm, I'm advising a student right now at UNCC working on unsupervised um, and like, it's great, but I haven't seen anything at least that would apply to manufacturing yet where I'm like, yes, like, let's go. We're going to have 10 times less data. It's going to be awesome. Right. Um, I've seen some interesting work out there, but nothing yet where I've been like, like, yeah, we can, we can move away from unsupervised. Right. So I think that's a huge area, you know, for, for, for progress to be made. And again, maybe there's a paper was published last week and I don't know about it and it's like, you know, going to change the world. Uh, but I, I haven't seen it yet. Right. So I think it's a really interesting area. Beautiful. Yeah. So that is something that it, this has been a recurring topic, actually. Semi-supervised learning, the capacity to be able to, to label a much larger data set than you have formally labeled right. is a superpower. I think that there's a lot of Individual approaches, people are always, there's, I don't think there's a magic bullet. Right. And um, yeah, it's, it's great. It's definitely an open question, something to work on yep. here. Yep, definitely. For sure. All right, so number five is a step yeah. away from technical. Um, yeah. yeah. Cool, yeah. So this one is more kind of on the business side. Um, and this side is really interesting to me too. My, my problem at work is that I think everything is interesting, which is a <laughs> blessing and a curse, right? So, um, but the, uh, this one is really about sales, commercialization, and startups, right? So I've, I've been involved in a, a few startups a- along the way. Um, but I'd say that if you look at 2020 for me, at least by far, I was most actively and more, more actively involved in the sales process than I have before, than I've been before. Um, and it was, it was really interesting, you know, coming into this role, it's one thing I wanted to learn more about. I'd say that if I look at previous startups I've been a part of or been a founder of, um, sales is definitely a weak point. You know, I'm definitely more technically strong than I am in sales. Um, and I kind of tell this story in the blog post. There's a, there's a book called Four Steps to the Epiphany, uh, by Steve Blink. Um, here it is, just in case you're interested, <laughs> if you're watching the video. <laughs> oh, um, nice. yeah, yeah. Um, but that back, back, that you can reach it from where you're sitting. Oh yeah, I got my whole bookshelf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, uh, yeah. So you know, right out of grad school, I, I went and founded a startup. I was going to 
revolutionize how uh, acoustic guitar pickups worked using machine learning. It was going to be life changing. Um, and I did make some, we made some cool stuff. It was awesome, but you know, not a commercial success, but, um, my advisor, I remember at the time he said, he said, Hey, go read this book. Um, so I read it and I thought it was terrible. I thought it was the most dry, stupidest book I'd ever read. <laughs> I was like, this is Steve Blank's four steps to the epiphany. I thought it was, yeah, I was like, this uh-huh. sucks. Yeah. Hey, uh-huh. I was, I was dumb. I, I read it readily. I mean, you know, I'll probably, in t- I wonder if in 10 years I'll think I am as dumb now as I, I think I am. I think I was 10 years ago, right? I don't know. Like, I don't know if early 20s is bad as early 30s for, <laughs> but uh, anyway, at the time, I, I mean, I thought it was fine, but nothing. I was like, this does not pertain to me, right? Um, but it did. I just didn't know it, right? Um, but uh, so as part of this year, right, I've been part of like, a, probably I was probably on like 100 sales calls last year or something like that. And just like in those experiences of like talking to real customers, doing real things and trying to explain how our technology can hopefully help them, right? And all the things, all the ways that can go wrong and go right, <laughs> right? Um, it's a super interesting problem. Um, and trying to kind of learn about the market while you're talking to customers, right? That's a huge piece of that book, right? Is that, you know, you're, it's not that you're just building what customers tell you to, but at the same time, you've got to pay attention to those market signals, right? They're, they're critical. Um, so after, you know, having these customer conversations, I kept thinking back to that book. I was like, oh, didn't Steve Blank explain this or something? Um, and I went back and read it last year. And yeah, he like predicted exactly what was going to happen. Like at our, it, was, it was like, it was uncanny. So uh, the second time I read it, oh my gosh, like it was super relevant. Lots of really interesting lessons. Um, he breaks down, like he kind of has some recommendations for how you should think about a startup. And he really recommends like four phases. Uh, the first phase is called customer discovery. And that's where you really like, you're not selling anything yet, but you're going to talk to customers and you are really learning about what you could sell basically. Um, and that is one thing I did get right in my first startup. Thanks to that advisor. He made like, I was ready to like go hack. I was like, oh, I'm ready to build. Let's go make this prototype. And he was like, no, you got to go talk to every guitar store owner in Atlanta. And I was like, oh God, this sounds terrible. But it was, it was super, it was super good that I did it. Um, so um, highly recommend the read. It's, it is kind of boring and dry the way he, he writes, I think, but uh, it's very relevant, but there is a cheat sheet now, actually. Yeah, Here's I was one. just going to mention that. Yeah. Here it is. Yep. So the entrepreneur, there's a, there's a much shorter version now <laughs> that has things boiled down. So if I was talking to myself 10 years ago when I founded my first startup, I would say, read this. It wasn't out yet, but the entrepreneur's guide to commercial development, to customer it's, development. The entrepreneur's yeah, because it's the cheat sheet to the four steps. It's, it's not really small right there. Yeah, it's the, right. it's the cheat sheet to the full kind of a uh, drier book, basically. So. <laughs> when you say but, cheat uh, sheet, I think a sheet of paper. It is many sheets of paper, but I agree. It, it says cheat sheet on the cover. We should, we should call up Brant Cooper and be like, Hey man, you know, cheat sheet is not what this is. <laughs> the cheat volume. <laughs> right. Cheat volume. Exactly. <laughs> uh, nice. All right. Well, that sounds like very practical advice. And I agree a hundred percent. It doesn't matter how good your tech is. Right. If you don't know how to sell it, you're never going to have a good startup. Totally. Yep. I couldn't agree more. Yep. Absolutely. And at the same time, it's not all about sales, obviously. And I think, I think for especially for more tech-focused people, like it's you kind of think that sales is like sleazy or something. That's not that's not really what we're talking about, right? We're really we're talking about um, like who are the people that are going to get value out of your thing, and what is your relationship with them, right? Like that that's really what we're talking about here, right? It's not about like spinning some crazy narrative or something. It's really about building some of those relationships and learning from them and explaining how you're set because you're going to learn so much about you know how you're communicating and how you're building what you're building, you know. I've had the same journey over the last decade where I definitely, in my early 20s, would have thought, sales, who needs yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yep. Make the yep. best tech ever. It's going to sell like hotcakes. Everyone's going to exactly. understand how amazing it is. Yeah, yep. Absolutely not. Um, no, no, no one cares. No one cares. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been exactly, as soon as, I, as soon as I put this landing page up, the world's going to change. You know, that was... <laughs> Acoustic pickups. No one's going to believe the sounds they hear. It's going to uh, blow their mind, Yeah. <laughs> Okay, sweet. Uh, so that's number five. Now we're we're getting to the second half of the list. Uh, we're rocking, yeah. Tools of computer science. Oh, this is a. I'm excited for this one. Yeah, me too. This is a cool area, right? So, um, you know, I, I I'm not a computer scientist by training, right? I kind of wish I had studied computer science. So, undergrad, I studied electrical engineering. Um, I feel like double E. This is just my own opinion, but I feel like double E was kind of the pinnacle of engineering from like 19. 19- 40 to 19 e is electrical engineering sorry yeah electrical engineering yeah i feel like it used to be like the the coolest engineering right and i feel like i joined the party a little late like it was a cool degree but i don't build circuits now or anything i don't really need to know how dsp works as cool as it is right so um you know did some math all kinds of stuff the like that booming space too if uh you want to be employable being able to make yeah. circuits yeah. is definitely it's uh you're not yes. gonna have a hard time finding work 
I fun. totally agree. Yeah, no regrets, <laughs> but I do wish I had like double majored and maybe done some more computer science. I kind of actually, this is embarrassing, but when I was like 18, I thought coding was lame, which is like, that's super embarrassing. <gasps> yeah, I don't, I know, I know, I know. I have a fin- podcast over, like get this guy out of, <laughs> get this guy out of here. Um, <laughs> um, but, but it, you know, I only took two computer science courses in undergrad and then I got to graduate school and everyone was like doing machine learning and I was like, oh crap, I got to learn Python. Like <laughs> this is, I'm, I'm way behind. Um, but, um, but uh, the, uh, the uh, so I, you know, no formal computer science training, right? Um, so, uh, so I, you know, I know some of these things, like I kind of know how databases work, but in 2020, because, uh, you know, I was leading not only the model creation part, but like the infrastructure code part, right? Um, I had to really learn and think about uh, uh, databases and global, like large scale databases and stuff like that. Um, so the, the things I bumped into, databases is definitely one of the big ones, but I also bumped into, you know, some other kind of fundamental computer science components. Um, especially when thinking about microservices and things like that. Um, but I'd say databases were the one that blew my mind. Um, so like, you know, a part of our stack, a part of our system, like if an operator in Michigan, for example, they see that, hey, our deep learning model is, you know, it's missing these defects, right? Um, she can actually go and tag it like in our app, right? And part of our backend, right, is we send that image up for retraining, right? Sounds simple, right? <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> um, so as, as part of building that infrastructure and it, you know, it, that part, it, that's fairly simple, but I, I kept thinking about like infrastructure, like Instagram, right? So, you know, we all just take for granted, Hey, I can open my phone. Oh, yeah. I, can, I can take a picture, I can post it. And all my friends, you know, John is going to have it 30 seconds, less than 30 seconds. He's going to have it five Instantly, seconds later. Yeah. Like yeah and we just, crazy. we just, uh, we're just like, Oh yeah, of course it works. Like, oh, you know, yeah. it's the internet. It just, you know, I think about that all the time. The level of, of. Uh, technical and, and especially consider that the it's so reliable and it's built on a hardware that is less reliable, right? So the hardware can have all and the networks, right? You got you got unreliable networks, unreliable disks, and uh, you know the the geniuses at Google and Facebook have figured out <laughs> and other companies have built this layer of software that is just so reliable that we you know we think it's as reliable as breathing, right? Like you know th- th- there's a cool there's a great book I read last year called Site Reliability Engineering from Google. Um, and they talk about how people check if the internet is working by going to google.com, right? They assume that Google is so reliable, right? That of course, you know, I can just check my internet access by going to Google, right? So like um, the, the, just the level of engineering that, that goes into that and making it actually work just, just blows my mind. And when I think about future things I'd like to make videos about or learn more about myself, um, I think doing something more about kind of databases or programming language or something more towards the fundamentals of computer science would be just, just fascinating. I do absolutely think it's hugely important. Um, I've so I mentioned earlier I had yeah. an employee who did the Georgia Tech uh, computer yeah. science masters, right. um, an AI specialization. And to people who are listening, if you already have a quantitative undergrad and you would like to take your data science, machine learning, data engineering, backend engineering capacity to the next level. And you, you really want to invest a couple of years in doing that. And it's going to be a lot of hard work, uh, but actually not that expensive, is this Georgia Tech Masters, I, I couldn't recommend it enough. I think it's, you know, it's the best remote learning option uh, you could have for that kind of background. And so seeing him, when we were thinking about the same kinds of things you're describing, getting code into production, having the machine learning models operate in a performant way that was efficient with respect to memory, and compute for any particular task, you've got to understand computer science. Yep, um, yep. It is not like if it, yeah, it's you know, when you think about data science, a lot of people think about the models and the models are important, but right. um, that next step, how your model is going to surface in the real world, that right. matters um, typically a lot more. So if, yep, you, yep. if you're a, so with my models, if, if I, we could spend R&D for years as a large team and make a model that is slightly more accurate than the model that I have today. Right. The user would never know. <laughs> yep, so yep. you might win a Kaggle competition or whatever, yep, yep, but it's yep. going to make no difference to your end user. What makes a yep. difference to your end user is that like you're describing that when they say something or do something, they get the results back in real time. Right. And in order to do that, having the caching work well, um, yep having redundancy built in. There's so many yep. things that you need to, to think about uh, and it's all computer science. So I'm absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and yeah, so, so seeing this, uh, Vince is his name and actually he's going to be on an upcoming. 
Oh, uh, awesome. That'll be cool. I'll, I'll look out, I'll look out for it. Yeah. I kind of feel like, I don't know if it's just my own career is developing or maybe the field of data science is developing, but I feel like either kind of the work you do as a data scientist will probably serve that. There's two big areas that come to mind for me, right? Either you're kind of more in the traditional BI kind of role where your deliverable is like, you know, insight to your leadership team, for example, right? And you're going to, your deliverable is like a Jupyter notebook or a deck, for example, right? Where you're going to explain, oh, I've, I've found these things and like traditional data mining, right? Um, so I feel like, you know, there's kind of a group of data scientists that are specializing that way. And then there's another group that I've been uh, either forced or pulled or, or walked into, right, which is kind of the production side of things where like, hey, you know, my deliverable is not insight necessarily. It's actually this model, this living, breathing model that's going to run 24-7 and do a thing, right? And if you're in that second camp, then yeah, software engineering and computer science, like they're real things that you should probably know something about, <laughs> right? And I say that uh, fully to my previous self, right? Where I, maybe I was a little arrogant five years ago and I was like, oh, I'm just going to train the model. Infrastructure is going to figure itself out. There's the cloud for that. I'll just throw it on AWS, Azure, whatever. It's going to be fine. Um, but but there's a whole layer there. And I think for bigger teams, you know, like um, uh, depending on where you are, you may just have that kind of unified, you know, you just focus on the models, right? And I think as you think about your career going forward too, just for the listeners, um, it's worth thinking about where you like to be. Um, I definitely really enjoy both sides. For me, kind of the modeling side is more academic, right? And it's a little slower paced, right? And I'm never gonna, no customer's ever gonna yell at me, right? So that's nice. Um, but then on the deployment side, like, yeah, there's some more stress for me at least, right? And you gotta kind of know more of the stack, but it can also be really rewarding, right? Because when at the end of the day, you build something that a user is like interacting with, there's like, a, there's their own level of satisfaction to doing that. I would say that I wouldn't probably get if I was kind of doing more like a static analysis, right? So. Um, so I think it's a really interesting direction. I'm not sure if that's kind of the field maturing or just my own career. I can't tell the difference sometimes, right? But that's definitely been what I've seen, you know, as I've, as I've been in data science for longer. I think it's both. I think that it yeah. is a common arc. I think that, um, I think a lot of people start in data science, you know, a really common um, trajectory into data science is you kind of start, like you're saying, with business intelligence or data analytics, yeah. like right. understanding distributions of data and how to, um, how to perform some relatively simple um, right. manipulations on them and show them in a nice way and understand what's happening in the data, correlations right. between data. Um, and then you're, and then that can lead quite naturally to data science where, um, where, yeah, you're modeling, you're making predictions about the future based on incomplete data. And it's more, it's, I think it's a, it's a more challenging step from data right. analytics. Typically, I think it's a, totally. common, I don't, you wouldn't, typically in a career go the other way. Right, yeah, yeah uh, I, I agree, that's a good point, yeah. And then the next step, I think in that journey that often is this kind of data engineering. Um, yeah, right. Software engineering, software engineering. I think that, I, I think that it is in a lot of ways, um, you, you're right that you can have, absolutely have these segregated teams where right, you have right. the computer science specialists and the data scientists and, and in, a, in right. a very large company, they could be totally separate. But right. I think in a lot of scenarios, particularly in any small or mid-size machine learning company, um, the data scientist learns on the job that if they want their model to make the biggest impact for customers, right, right. starting to get involved with the software I agree. Side of things is, is... I couldn't agree more. Yep, absolutely. I think it's super interesting too, because I'm not sure that there's an obvious place to me today where people kind of learn that. Um, because it's not part of like, you know, there's a bunch of data science education popping up, which is great. And most of that is focused on, you know, the, the modeling, right? Um, and maybe it's just my own bias for not having a computer science background, right? But to me, it was like, holy crap, I've got a bunch to learn, <laughs> right? You know, um, and, and uh, maybe it is just kind of pure computer science, but I do feel like this stuff is changing quickly enough where like the things about like the way we're using container containerization and some of these you know, kind of newer technologies, I feel like I wouldn't have learned them in school anyway, probably, right? I mean, maybe some of these more up-to-date degrees for sure, but um, yeah. It, yeah. It's a tricky one. I think it, it yeah. underlines the importance of so education was, I guess, point number three, I think. It, uh, yeah, right. And this is a part of it is in this field, in a field like data science um, or data engineering or even data analytics, the um, the stack, what you need to know is changing so quickly. Like containers, yeah. like saying Docker containers. Right. Um, it's something five years ago, you could absolutely not know what that is. In fact, yep. Yep. Even I, I, that they were five years ago. But I don't today, know. I, I definitely didn't know about them five years ago. <laughs> But yeah, today it's a fundamental part of building a machine learning application using is, Kubernetes yeah. probably to be able to have to have um, scalability of your Docker containers. Yep. And yeah, these are the kinds of things. And so I think it's kind of tricky. It's hard to say like, oh, you definitely need to follow this particular educational path because I think it's right. it emphasizes the ongoing learning, like just yeah. being able to, you need to spend some time in your week, every week, 
just learning about some new things that are happening and um, yeah yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, just one more riff off this real quick is the in, the, in the class I teach, you know, my class is very much, it's the theory, right? So it's how to train deep learning models for computer vision, and we do some analytical approaches too and things like that. But we only have like one lecture or half a lecture on like deployment and infrastructure and stuff. And there was a really common request this year, and it should be, right? Um, and you could easily, I feel like, do a, I could do a whole, it might be out of date in two years, right? But it could easily be a whole class, right? But all this, all this stuff that goes into infrastructure that's, and deployment, you know? That's why we don't. That's exactly why we don't have more classes on it because it's too yeah. hard to keep the curriculum yeah. up to date. I know. Yeah. So that's exactly because you want when you yeah. to teach something to have a curriculum on something. There needs to be yeah. some kind of stability. And sure, so, sure. and this is this is I've had the same. Um, so I created my own deep learning curriculum. Yeah. And yeah. When I offer that class, yeah, it's inevitable. You know, ten or twenty percent of people are going to come up to me individually and say, "This is all great. I'm glad we learned the models, but right. are, when are we going to cover deployment?" And I'm like, yeah. "I." just can't keep yeah. it up to date. I know, I, like, yeah. I, I agree. You know, it would be like, you just kind of have to learn on your own. It's something that you can get on the job. Yeah, that's been a battle I've had at YouTube, right? I've wanted to cover like some more, like I, I've, I've half written a series on generative adversarial networks, but like I couldn't keep up with the literature. Like every time I'd have like a decent script, some new paper would come out and I'd be like, crap. Like, so like one, one thing I like about the imaginary number series is I'm not covering anything that was invented past like 1860 or something, right? So, so it's like, like, I know that it's figured out, right? So that's kind of depressing because we need fresh content out there, but the delivery mechanism of YouTube is kind of challenging because just like you said with your deep learning course, like you invest a lot of time trying to get it right you know um, and it's changing so fast that it's like darn it's going to be out of date before i publish it <laughs> you know nice well uh all right let's move on with the list uh i think this is going to be a i think this will be a nice segue i think this actually this riffs right off it i think yeah it <laughs> sorry, is. I, inter yeah. I interrupted you no, sorry no, no. okay you did all right me. it's it's i mean you're the guest it's really your show i'm just here to like make it sure that it keeps running i just got to make sure the camera's on uh <laughs> so number seven is yep. Open source and why it matters. Um, so this is an area I need to, like I said, the part of my my challenge, and I'm, I'm, it's becoming very obvious to me now in this podcast, is like, I just have a bunch of questions, right? Um, but let me get into these these questions about open source, right? So let me give a little bit of context, and then I think we're going to tie it back, I think, to content going out of date, I think. So, uh, so stay tuned. In five minutes, we should be back to that, I think, with an interesting layer on top of it, I think. <laughs> so here we go. Um, so the context, right? So when I think about like open source software, um, to me, and I think this, I was kind of reflecting on it. I think it has to do kind of with like when I grew up. So to me, like I very much remember like when I came of age, like, you know, in high school, right? Um, like Wikipedia had just cut, like was just becoming a cool thing. And like in 2004, I was in high school and I just had my mind blown by Wikipedia. I was like, holy crap, this is like a live, you know, it, it feels different than anything that was created by a company ever could, right? It's because of the open source model. It's because, you know, people who give a damn about it are, are working on it all over the world at the same time. And that's incredible, right? Um, so I think kind of as a result of some of those early experiences, like I think there's this kind of assumption in my head um, and I, I wrote it down. So the assumption that that kind of is just part of, I think, you know, just in my head, it's that. It's that the most reliable and maintainable software in the world is created using like an open source model. So I kind of like feel like that's true, but I, I never really challenged it or thought about it until last year when I was kind of, you know, at work, I had to think of some stuff. Um, and I picked up a book, maybe you've read it. It's The Cathedral and the Bazaar. I happen to have all these books on my shelf right here, thankfully. I've um, heard of it. Yeah, it's uh, highly recommended. Uh, again, I'm still at the bottom of the learning curve on this, but um, but one of the things that, that, that the author Eric S. Raymond talks about is this, he has this idea of Linus's law, basically for Linus Torvalds, the Linux, Linux creator. Um, so Linus's law is, you know, given enough eyeballs, uh, all bugs are shallow, um, which I think is really cool, right? So as soon as you're in a silo, as soon as you're stuck in one company, um, it's very easy to have these bugs that seem really tough. But as soon as you're in this open source model, you know, someone out there has going to, is going to be an expert on this and they're going to be able to solve it, you know, in no time, right? Um, so I think I've got kind of two riffs off that, and I want to tie back to the uh, to the original point. But my my first riff is really just thinking about like um, you know, and maybe I'm behind the ball here. Open source has been around for a while, but I, it does come up, you know. So like you know, my company sells proprietary software, and we we le we leverage open source stuff just like everyone else does. Um, so I think an important question to think about is like, okay, if open source in some ways is kind of a, a better model of software development, and not always, right? But in some cases, right. Um, when should you not do open source? How does it intersect with commercialization, right? Um, and and I feel like also like 
throughout my career, like I've, I've worked with a few different lawyers along the way. And I'm always asking them questions like, how does this work exactly? You know, and I've never like, maybe I'm just not smart enough to understand it. But I feel like even the law around that governs the intersection of open source and commercial software is like super fuzzy. <laughs> um, and it's just, and it's an area that I, I, I think if I had one question about it, it would be like, if you're starting a startup tomorrow, right? And let's say you're making software, right? What are the big things you should think about as far as open source versus not? What is the place for proprietary code? Um, why do you do it? You know, what's the advantage? Obviously, if you're selling something, there's that's there's a, there's a layer to it there. Um, but but um, if open source is so good, why don't we do it all the time, right? I guess is maybe that's my my question in a nutshell, right? And again, no answer, only questions. <laughs> Yeah, and I have a lot of ideas. There's a lot of places that we could go from here, but in the interest yeah. of time, and us still having three points left, and sure. not trying to let the podcast go too long, although it's been every minute. I hope <laughs> it has been as interesting for our listeners as it is. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, open source is uh, hugely important, and but I thought did that tie directly back to the last point that we were talking about? Here, here it is. Ready? Here we go. Okay, so that was Linus's law, right? Given given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. So I would like to present my corollary to Linus's law. Here we go. This is something that drives me crazy as a YouTube creator. Um, so my corollary is basically, um, so when you make something for enough people to see and you care about being right, you're eventually going to screw up. <laughs> that's my that's my corollary. And my thinking on it basically is like, and there's a really good video from CGP Grey. Um, I've linked it in the uh, in the blog post. Um, but he talks about how like this like very real fear of being wrong on the internet. And we kind of laugh about it, but like when you're trying to get something right, and I'm sure you know this, John, from making your course, right? When you're trying to like, when you're trying to be right, <laughs> right? Like there's a certain level of anxiety that comes with that. And in some, in the worst case, it can, it can paralyze your creation process because you're like, I don't, I'm not the expert. I don't know how to, you know, I don't know how to be right about this. And it's kind of scary because if you do have a popular or even semi-popular channel and you know, people are going to look at it, you know, someone out there is going to be more of an expert than me. That's the reason open source software works because someone, you know, you have this open development model. But when you're doing content creation, at least the way I've done it in the past, it's very much this like step, you know, where like I'm going to create it and then I'm going to release it, right? And there's not a dialogue with the community. Um, and I'm sure someone out there smarter than me has figured out or is figuring out how to do that dialogue with the community as part of creating content like for YouTube, but I have not figured it out, I, I guess I would say. Um, and it can really work against you in these creative situations where you're trying to be right because Linus's law will work against you, right? When you're trying to kind of be authoritative on a, on a topic, you know? Yeah, beautifully said. Um, I think you're exactly spot on. And I... So now we're going to move to the next point, but I actually, I unless this will completely derail the way you wanted to cover this, 8, 9, and 10, I think are actually related. Okay. So um, 8 is about social justice. Sure. 9 is about information in politics. Yep. And 10 is about climate change. And so yep. all three of your final 10 uh, points, uh, final 10, all three, <laughs> The final three of your 10 points <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, are related in the sense that um, th there are these big problems, also big opportunities sure, sure. in the world around yeah. social justice, in, uh, politics, uh, and uh, truthfulness in politics, yeah. accurate information totally. in politics, yeah. right. um, and uh, climate change. And a lot, there's, these are interrelated in many ways, sure. um, these three concepts. A lot of polarizing views where one person often has the same polarized view on all three issues <laughs> sure, that sure. is opposite. To, yeah, in, yeah. In the United States, yeah. we call them Democrats and Republicans. Sure. Um, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, so fill us in on, on these three really big, uh, important topics and, and it may be yeah. any machine learning or data science uh, relationships. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. And, and again, I'm total, you know, I, I'll just I'll give you my opinion on these things. And they're obviously huge topics. They could be their own podcast easily. Mm -hmm. um, but the, but they are. When I think about the things that are important, that really you know, that I thought about a lot in 2020, that 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 are um, what what it seems to me to be the important topics. These I think have got to be on the list. Um, so the first one, yeah, it's it's you know, social justice, and I think you know the the Black Lives Matter movement of, of 2020. You can't you can't watch that. I think and think that it's you know you can't ignore it. I don't think, and not that I was trying to, but at the same time, like it's a you know. Uh, uh, shift that happened, I think, in 2020. Um, and like the thing I talk about in the post a little bit is like, you know, uh, when I see something like that, I, I really want to think, you know, how does, how, how can I make a difference here? Right. And I think about the one thing that pops into my head right away is, is the course I teach. Um, and, you know, I'm in Charlotte. Um, 
And Charlotte uh, has the unfortunate reputation or that there's a study done, uh, I think in 2017, of social mobility among the top 50 American cities. Um, I, I think it's actually economic mobility. Um, and Charlotte is 50 out of 50. So we are the wow. worst upwardly mobile city in the country uh, out of those top 50, which is, um, you know, not, not, not a great claim to fame. Um, and I think about my course. So I teach a graduate level computer vision course in Charlotte. There's 60 students every year. Um, it's very internationally diverse. It's great. Um, but as far as like kids from Charlotte, especially from like underprivileged backgrounds who come to my class, there's never been one. So I, you know, wow. it's 180 students and it's, it's zero, right? Um, and I don't want to be like self-centered about it. Obviously, there's other things that they can do. Maybe they don't want to study computer vision, but I, I think about some of the salaries that come from you know these disciplines, and it seems like it's not just a coincidence, I guess, right? It seems like things there's there's that's uh, I'm seeing a symptom of this problem, I think, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I just can't help thinking about what can, you know what are the barriers in Charlotte? Let's just take Charlotte as an example. Like, why are those kids not in my class, right? Um, and maybe there's a benign explanation. Maybe they go to college elsewhere, but I think I think there's there's more going on. Um, so the, the questions I have in this section are, you know, what are the barriers that keep them from pursuing that path? What can we do about them? Um, that's something I really want to learn more about this year. Um, I do think that as far as like people who are talking about this, especially in data science, uh, you know, I follow Jeremy Howard's work pretty closely. Um, him and Rachel Thomas, who founded Fast AI, uh, they have some really great writing about ethics and data science, um, which we could go really deep down. Um, but that's when I think about how can I make a difference? How does this impact my life? That's an area that really pops up for me. And again, no answers, but it's something that um, I think it's a real signal um, and uh, something that I, I need to learn more about this, this year. You know, I know there's foundations in Charlotte that are working on this exact problem, so I would love to understand what their what their uh, understanding of the problem is and what they're what they're working on. Nice. And we, um, if people are interested and haven't already heard, um, in uh, a recent episode of the Super Data Science Podcast. Um, which aired March 4th, um, we focus primarily on, um, uh, on unethical or ethical AI. Um, awesome. So both the industry as well as issues with models uh, and even hardware, actually, which is something oh. that I knew that I learned in that episode. So right. um, I totally agree that this topic could be an entire podcast, and we did that. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming um, up yeah, March 5th. Yep. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, from the perspective of the listener, that is in the That's past. right. It already okay. happened. Yep. Go back. Yep. <laughs> um, nice. And uh, yeah, I don't know if, if you want to wrap up yeah. with uh, politics and climate change. Uh, yeah, I lo love to. Yeah, these are, I just have a little questioning around them, but yeah, absolutely. Um, so obviously 2020 was a crazy year politically. Um, and I think for me, you know, I, I obviously don't work directly in that area, but I think as a technologist, um, it just helps, it makes me wonder, you know, um, how does the work that that myself and my peers do, how does that impact what's happening in politics, right? Um, and I think what's really, like, I don't know, I think if I think about how old I am now and when I kind of came of age and stuff, you know, like, my my youth was really as the internet was becoming a thing, right? So, you know, when uh, when I got, when we got our first computer, I remember when we got it on the internet, like in 1995, right? And that was like a big step, right? Um, and there's a lot of optimism, I think, early on, right? The internet's going to make the world this more transparent place because you've got more information, right? Everyone can get the information they need. Um, but if you look at 2020, gosh, it seems like the exact opposite is happening, right? So um, it's not, uh, it seems like it's making the world less transparent and there's, you know, uh, it's less, it's harder to get through information, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's one of those things I think about, like, you know, is there a technological solution to this? Are things like, you know, um, can we get verifiable facts through the technology, like a new kind of technology, or is it more of a policy thing, right? Like, do, you, do we need more regulation or something, right? So just something that, you know, I, I couldn't help but think about last year as just because it was so crazy, right? <laughs> totally. Yeah. In the U.S. is really crazy for sure. Um, yeah. And yeah, I thought some of the same things and I actually, yeah, there are definitely people working on ways with, with models to try to, yeah. um, to try to surface more accurate information. It's, uh, I think it's a, it's a huge disservice to society when, um, when a fictitious point of view is just completely, yeah, be becomes so prominent and, yeah. um, and, and ultimately, yeah, it, it, it makes lives worse. Um, so, if there are technical solutions, I think also policy solutions, I think it's going to be a mix of both. And hopefully right. 
because of how crazy things have become um, that people are going to be making headways on this uh, headway on those things. Definitely yeah. something to think about. Totally. And speaking of um, issues that are, are already big issues and no matter what we do is going to become a much bigger issue over the coming decades, but we have some green shoots of progress and data can play a role. We also actually in a, in a forthcoming episode, I think it's going to air in April. Um, so I mentioned him just quickly. I said his first name, Vince, is going to be on an upcoming episode of the Super Data Science Podcast. And we are going to spend the entire episode talking about how machine learning and data science can be used to uh, help the environment, to help with climate change. Awesome. And, Super cool. Yeah, but please also, Stephen, tell us your thoughts. <laughs> So this will be a, just a uh, this will be a, a preview or an encouragement to watch that listen to that episode. That sounds that sounds awesome. Um, and again, this this is just kind of reflecting on you know what I've been up to for the last ten years. And when I think back, like you know about a decade ago is when I went to to graduate school. So I actually I studied environmental engineering actually for graduate school. Um, I wanted to go work on big problems. Um, and at the time, I was I was pretty fired up to like let's go work on climate change. This was like two thousand nine. Um, you know, Obama was freshly in office. He had just appointed uh, Stephen Chu from from Berkeley to uh, to be his Secretary of Energy, and I was like, I'm going to Berkeley. This is going to be awesome. I, you know, um, so when I when I got there, you know, I looked at different research opportunities, and a lot of the research I found, or the people that were working on climate change, um, they were really working on it from a policy perspective, right? And that, and that makes sense. Kind of the 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 thesis there, right? And there's a, a, a well known paper called Stabilization Wedges where they talk about how you know, it's from 2004 or something, but they say, you know, technology's here, we, we can we can curb this, we just need the policies to do it, right? Um, so a lot of the focus, at least of the, the labs that I kind of visited at, in, in graduate school, um, was was in that, in the policy region. And at the time, I was like, you know, I'm not sure I can make an impact in politics, I'm more technical, and that was my bias, at least then. So I went off and researched something else. It was really interesting, I used machine learning to, uh, to actually predict when snow was going to melt, which is a really important uh, resource in California. The melting snow is like 60% of their water supply or something. So really, really cool uh, research. But I, anyway, I didn't, you know, I didn't dive into, into climate change. Um, and then I was like, you know, well, I was like, well, we're making progress. This is great. But I look back on this 10 years later, and I feel like it's kind of one step forward, two steps backwards, you know, and in a lot of ways, like, um, and it's kind of discouraging, right? And maybe I'm just being negative, right? Um, but reflecting back now, I, I wonder, like, at the time, you know, I, I just did a, this was, you know, 10 years ago, I just did a cursory look around the university to see what was happening. And it didn't seem like there were big technical pushes on climate change. It just seemed like mostly policy, right? Um, and I'm excited to listen to this podcast because I really want to learn, you know, what are the technical ways to make a difference to obviously, just like the information and politics thing, just like social justice, policy matters, of course, right? But, but technology matters too, right? Um, so just another area I'm excited to learn more about in 2021. I think it's a really important area. Um, and yeah, I, I really, I think the thing I'm most curious about is, you know, is it, is it the case that we just need to change our policies or is it more, you know, should, how much should we be investing in policy versus technology? And obviously it's a both and strategy, right? But, um, I just, I'm really curious to hear some other thinkers explain, you know, their thinking on those two trade-offs because, Sometimes, in some ways, the technology is really simple. It's just about energy balance, right? So if we're burning more energy than we're able to get out of the earth sustainably, then it's not going to work, right? So that I think a, a cursory physics look at this, you could say, oh, there's no room for innovation because of the first law of thermodynamics, right? Um, but I, I'm sure there's more to it than that, and I'm excited to, to learn more. <laughs> nice. Um, well, thank you so much, Stephen, for taking us through your uh, 10 wonderfully thoughtful points. Um, in your coming up for air blog post, uh, tons of food for thought, lots of jumping off points and many resources that you provided with us already, um, with, with books, uh, and, uh, other blog posts, videos, um, all of which to, all of which are linked to from your blog post, but we'll also capture those in the show notes for, awesome. for today's episode. Uh, and then could you please let viewers know, uh, how they can get in touch with you, how they should be following you online. Obviously, yeah. the Welch Labs YouTube channel is a great choice. Yeah, that, that's probably the best place. Uh, you can go to welchlabs.com as well. Uh, I do publish a blog there from time to time. Uh, but yeah, YouTube and, and, and welchlabs.com are probably the best places to, uh, to get in touch. Beautiful. All right, thank you so much, Stephen. This has been such a wonderful episode. I've learned so much and I can't wait to catch up with you again. Maybe in two years, we can have you on the show Oh, I'd love to, yeah. Where will we be? Yeah, hopefully all all 10 problems will be solved in two years. (laughs) No doubt about it. No doubt. (laughs) Awesome, I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. You're welcome, see you soon. Well, 
I'm sure you can tell, I thoroughly enjoyed that episode. What a treat to have Steven's insightful thoughts on what's really important in a data science career. We talked about empowering all people with deep learning powered tools, the trade-offs and opportunities of virtual education, widening the impact of machine learning with semi-supervised models, the critical importance of technology sales, the massive value of computer science and open source software, and the opportunity for machine learning to contribute to meaningful progress in social equality, political truthfulness, and avoiding climate change. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, and the URLs for Steven's website and YouTube channel at superdatascience.com 453. That's superdatascience.com 453. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd of course greatly appreciate it if you left a review on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube. I also encourage you to tag me in a post on LinkedIn or Twitter, where my Twitter handle is at John Crone Learns. To let me know your thoughts on this episode, I'd love to respond to your comments or questions in public and get a conversation going. All right, it's been a great episode. I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.